There we go. Hello, everybody. Welcome to March's Eye on ESI. I am Maribel Rivera. Um, I am the Vice President of Strategy and Client Engagement, which is just fancy way of saying that I am in charge of our global community. I'm joined today by my monthly partner in crime, Jared Casalia, who is the CEO and founder of True Staffing Partners. Hey, Jared, how are you doing? Hi, Maribel. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So we're almost at the end of this quarter. Can you believe it? I can believe it. It's <laughs> zipping by and that means things are busy when it feels like it's zipping by. So I can't complain. So much happening. Uh, and, you know, every month we do this. And so I am excited. I want to see what's happening. And you had a report. You've got a lot to share with us. We've got some really good data, right? We're all about data. So we've got some good data to talk about. We are. We are all about data. I was telling my team that, um, you know, Biden really impressed me on his state of the union with his effective aggression and that <laughs> effective aggression always comes with statistics. Yes. So uh, we have. Before you get started, I just want to share for anyone who's new, if you've been with, with us, and I know there's some of you, I'm going to start saying, you know, congratulations to those who are with us every month. But yeah. um, for those who are new, this is a, in, a very interactive, engaging conversation. Throw your questions in the chat. Let us know what's happening. We'll, let, we'll answer your questions. If you got questions about any of the data that, that Jared's going to share, um, please feel free to ask. We've got a lot to cover, so we'll go really fast, but we like to get your questions. Yeah, interject with questions. Don't wait till the end. Uh, we're going to cover a lot of the stuff that we haven't covered yet that's in our 2023 uh, data set, which is our 2024 jobs report for e-discovery, which we released at the end of January. And this will sort of be the last go through of all this data to examine what got us to the point that we're at today. And on next month's for April's series, we'll be presenting all the Q1 data uh, that's similar to these trends and in these categories and a few additional things we've been tracking that we can't wait to surprise everybody with. So uh, with no further ado, <laughs> uh, let's jump right in and talk about the things that we haven't covered so far that come from our jobs report from 2003. Excellent. We can move to the next slide. Here we go. All right, motivations. Uh, and this is really important because it's changing dramatically. When we look at 2023 in totality, you could see that some things really didn't change that much from 2022. And the number one reason why job seekers are coming to us looking for employment is still centered around working in an office versus working more remotely in home. And look, that could be for people who are working in a hybrid capacity where it's three days a week and they want to go down to two or one or zero. It could be for somebody that's working five days a week that needs to go down to three days a week. But when people come to us and say, I need more flexibility to work from home, the commute is killing me. Um, that is the number one reason why people are still looking for work. Now, I will share with you, and Maribel and I talked about this in great detail. You could see here that burnout has now made the list for 2023. And I'll share with you that burnout didn't make the list at all in 2022. And it didn't make the list for the first three quarters of 2023. It was so aggressively a motivator for people in Q4 of last year that it made the annual top five list. And right now, burnout is running neck and neck with motivations for why job seekers are coming to us in addition to working remotely from home. You'd be shocked to know that money has now decelerated almost to number five on the list in terms of what's driving people to come to the market. Um, other things are driving them. And these other things are sometimes new things that we've never experienced before prior to the pandemic. So it's impacting uh, what we look at. And you know, Maribel wanted me to define burnout, which I think is wise. <laughs> Because uh, it's not just one thing. It's not just more hours and more work, although it can be that. It's often a lack of organizational resources, um, whether it's talent, technology, organization, right? Disorganization often leads to burnout very quickly, right? We're not working efficiently. Um, the hours I'm putting in don't feel like impact hours. They feel like makeup work in a lot of ways. Um, also, a lack of top-down leadership people feeling like they're burnt out on a lack of vision or a lack of knowing where they're going either individually or where the company's going leads to burnout. Um, and number five is really important, interview fatigue. 
Uh, one of the things we do for our customers, and we just got uh, back from Legal Week where we presented these metrics to a lot of our customers in person, is how many rounds of interviews it takes to get to a hire, both first round and total rounds per role. I mean, we break down all sorts of fun metrics. And interview fatigue is a big problem for a lot of our customers. We're starting to hear candidates come to us after interview saying, these guys feel burnt out. So the burnout isn't only coming from the job seeker who's looking for work. The burnout is coming from witnessing that burnout from the people they're interviewing for at a potential position. And that is then deterring them from enthusiasm around that opportunity. I'll pause I mean, for a second there, Bill. Yeah, I mean, that that's a huge thing, right? When, you, when you're going to look for a job and you're seeing the individuals and you're, you're getting the sense of burnout from them, that's a huge red flag that you may not want to join that company due to the culture that's there, right? Again, lack of top-down leadership or sometimes too much top-down leadership where the leadership isn't listening to the employees, right? The people who are on the ground doing all the work, sometimes that can cause some burnout as well because strategy is constantly coming from top-down and it's always about meeting the revenue numbers but not always listening to what's happening to help change the organization. I also think it's worth giving everybody this bit of guidance, which is uh, rarely given to interviewers, which is on an interview, you want to be authentic, but you want to be your best authentic self. I can have a really bad day and be really off and perform really poorly and still be very authentic. Yes. Uh, and I think a, a, a trend that we've seen from hiring managers is to almost hyper exaggerate the negative in, in the thinking is let me make it seem like it's going to be more work than it is or that you know you're not going to have everything so that when they come on board uh the expectations are much better than what we said on an interview and so they're happy that's not a good strategy generally speaking right you want to be authentic but you want to want an interview just like the candidate is present your best authentic self Yes. It's game face time, guys. It's not time for you as a company to open the, the closet and show all the ugly secrets on an interview. That, that That's not appropriate, right? You have to put your best forward, foot forward if you're expecting the job seeker to yeah. also put their best foot forward. And it's funny, you could have had a just a bad morning and now you're taking it out in the wrong way in an interview. So you've got to, I would say, take a few minutes before that interview Put aside everything else, whatever's happening at the company, it might be a bad day. You might have had an argument with someone within a, another department or area, but refocus, right? From your zen, you got to go to your happy place. Yes. All right. My happy place is a beach, so it will always be there. <laughs> <laughs> um, these are the top five motivators for ESI sales reps, which are very different than people that are not selling services. And it's really interesting because number two here, number one is always number one. Yes. Everybody always comes to us because of a change in comp plan and it probably always will be number one. Number two here is new though. We've gotten a lot of sales rep in the last six months who have come to us because their feeling is if they can no longer get business from their core customer portfolio because of work product performance and deliverable issues. And they're at a place where they're saying, I, I got to take my book somewhere else because my customers are no longer giving me the amount of business or any business based on work product performance. Um, and, and this also is connected to burnout. Yeah. Right? When people perform poorly or they don't have enough resources and customers don't get what they're looking for, it's now starting to trickle all the way down or up the food chain, depending on how you want to look at it, to the sales rep being impacted uh, and being motivated for these reasons. So uh, we, we, we draw these trends out there to, you know, give everybody a sense of what's in the mind of the e-discovery job seeker. Now, it's also worth noting that um, on that chart, go back one more second, MT. On that chart, this move into leadership and move into other um, tertiary lines of business that are outside of e-discovery, uh, I can tell you that those two are huge motivators for sales reps that come to us, but very few of them wind up getting those jobs. Most and of them wind up staying in the industry in individual contributor positions, not leadership. I mean, and how many positions of leadership, right? If you've got a, right. a lot of ESI salespeople moving, how, there's not a lot of leadership positions for salespeople to move into. That's correct. And with consolidation, um, you know, continuing the way it has, those become even more finite as companies converge. Interesting. Yeah. 
And do you get a feeling that we might see some more mergers and acquisitions this year? I mean, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, why wouldn't we? You know, I think the world is moving towards more companies going IPO and merging and there's more money in the business. And yeah, I think we'll see some more. I also think some people had some really successful, you know, 2023s. I think 2024 will be even more successful. And not to bring up the, the the worst word in the world that everyone's saying right now, but if you go back one, one again. Oh, sorry. <laughs> what did you say? Entitled? That's the worst I, word. That's a good, no, a, AI, where everyone is saying it. Oh, yeah, sure. We think that maybe at some point service delivery issues with uh, a more automation and AI, Gen AI being put into place, that some of those, hopefully companies might look at that as how they can. I, mean, I, I know you don't deal with that, but you and I talk about things like this all the time. Well, so. we do deal with it. I mean, our yeah. business here at True, you know, regardless of what we do for a business, has integrated all sorts of AI into our business over the last 14 months. Um, and it has allowed my existing staff to do a lot more with yeah. less human resources, you know, in the organization, which has reduced costs, which has allowed us to spend money on other things that are more important to the yeah people that work here or to the business in terms of aiming for growth. So, you know, look, I think what is everybody's best kept secret is how they as departments or individuals are integrating AI, not as a resellable tool with which to generate revenue or change the doc review game, but rather to create efficiencies in their own internal operations that elevate and improve customer experience um, and ultimately revenue. And, and those, I think, will now start seeing clear, you know, differentiators who can brag about what they've done to do that, right? I mean, my organization can brag about all sorts of things we've done to do that, not the least of which is being able to handle volumes of inbound resumes um, and filter them appropriately based on who's right for what opportunity. Yeah. And I would find it extremely interesting if you're putting Gen AI, if you're using Gen AI for your own products and services, but not implementing it into your uh, Correct. Into your uh, work processes. So that would be interesting. Sorry about that. All no, right. it's a great injection. We can always inject with some AI. Yes. Um, and just let me know if people have questions. I'm not watching the queue. So you'll let yeah, me I'm, I've got you. I'm watching it. Cool. And again, this is an interactive conversation. We want all your questions, even if it's a question about you know, what do I need to do to uh, to be at an interview? Jared and I are here to answer any and every question when it comes to your careers and your professional growth. So let's talk about speed of hire really quickly, because this is a big metric that I, I think has significant impact on people's success getting hired and looking to hire. Um, here you'll see that in for those of you that are new to us in Q1 and Q2, which we call the height of the great resignation, Things were crazy. We were moving executives at 35 days. We were moving sales reps in 30, mid-market professionals, PMs, analysts, analytics um, at 14, and contractors in uh, under a week. Uh, this is steady. This is so dramatically different than the pre-pandemic timelines. Things have slowed down as we've gone through what I'm calling 23 and 24, the great recalibration. This is what we see as the new normal speed of hire. And what's circled in red is what your timeline is based on market trends and the tempo with which people hire in the market before a candidate who's actively searching has other offers. So if you're looking to be the first offer a candidate receives and win the best candidates just based on moving quickly, these are the timelines you wanna to calibrate to. If you're a contractor, it's gotta be under 14 days, really around 10, which is two business weeks. If you're a mid-market direct hire, it's around 40 days, but you'll see that that fluctuates pretty consistently between 35 and 40. And when we go and looked at, uh, when we went and looked at February, February is actually down into the high 20s. Uh, people really accelerated speed of hire in February because they had slowed down a bit in January um, uh, compared to prior years. For sales reps, it's about 80 days. For executives, it's about 90. Now, just to give you a sense of what things were before the pandemic, I think, do we have that here? Is that next? Do we have pre? Yeah, I thought you had a comparison. Yeah, I think we, could, we could skip one and we'll come back. Yeah. 30 days for contractors is now 10. Three to six months for ESI sales is now 80 days. 60 to 90, which is really more like 80, is around 40. Um, and 90 days now for um, executive search. Um, often it's a lot less than that. Um, we've got a few managers and directors we placed in February where those searches were under 45 days. So things are accelerating. Generally speaking, the timelines are half or less 
than what we experienced during the pandemic. And what does that mean? It means more jobs get accepted and vacated faster, which means the acceleration of hiring happens quicker, which means there are more jobs coming, which means the trends in the industry change at a faster frequency than they used to prior to the pandemic. Why are things happening so much faster? Well, not the least of which is all this virtual interviewing. 100% of first round interviews through our organization for the last three years have been remote, 100%. We haven't had a single first round where I come to the office. Yeah. 90% of all subsequent interviews, even for jobs where someone has to come into an office three days a week, are fully remote. That remoteness has made people more available, scheduling happened faster, accelerated the speed of hire to where we are today. Now, why is speed of hire so important? Well, we've gone and looked at when a candidate receives multiple offers or only one, what's the likelihood that they're going to say yes, just based on the order in which they receive those offers. And you can see that in 2022, the height of the great resignation, you only had a 45% chance if you were the fastest and you got that candidate their first offer because they knew they could get a second and a third and they wanted to line up all their options. They had lots of choices and then they were going to pick the best, maybe leverage a higher offer for another offer that they really wanted, but wanted more money. We saw a lot of that happening in 2022. Then everything turned around in Q4 2022. Zuckerberg lays off 10,000 people. Everybody follows suit. We all think we're going into a recession. And for the first three quarters of last year, 80% of people accepted the first offer they received, meaning they didn't wait for a second or third, or when they got a second or third, they still chose the first four out of five times. That right. dipped in Q4 to 65%, which just shows you things are getting more competitive. People are getting more multiple offers. They're not necessarily taking the first, but we're still in a climate where being first and being fast leads to a higher likelihood that that person is going to say yes. And so we encourage both job seekers and hiring managers to calibrate as the timelines we've outlined stipulate in order to get the best offer you want, get the best candidate you want. And keep in mind, a lot of people, when they don't get their first choice candidate, they start their whole process over again. So now you might be looking at another 30 to 90 days before that person comes on board, before they have an impact and relieve pressure from those having burnout, before they start billing and generating revenue. And, and you know, it, it has a ripple effect. So time is so important to the hiring process. And we hope that these metrics give everybody a sense of how quickly they need to move in order to get the top choice. Yeah. I have uh, two questions. So we have a question in, um, and I love these questions. My, Mike's not here with us this week, but he loves these questions the most. But um, first, my first question is counter offers. Are we seeing those go down or how are we, what I, cause I don't think we went over that, but I would yeah. like a little so bit. Of we went for, I think 170 days in Q2, three and part of four before anyone that we had an offer extended to got a counter offer. It was the longest period since we've been tracking that trend that we've seen no one even get a counter offer. Why? Well, most people didn't have budget for the first three quarters of last year. And, right. and most people were looking to cut staff. So if someone's going to leave, that's one less person I have to fire, right? And so nobody was getting counter offers. That started to change in Q4. And we do include counter offers in, it would be a second or third offer, depending on the order. Like if they got one, two, and then a counter when they went to resign, we would call that a third. Okay. Um, so counter offers are generally in the second or third and we, what we're categorizing here is third is third or more. Some people do get okay. fourth, fifth, right. Or three offers and then a counter that fourth would be third here. Um, but people aren't accepting them. Right. Right. We've only had, I think two people in all of 2023, except the counter offer. Now that's because most of them didn't get. One. All right. Awesome. So a comment from one of our attendees, remote interviews via video tech platforms enable a lot of cost avoidance, which we're all about candidates, travel, lodging, et cetera. Uh, extremely true. It also enables you, I would say, to have better uh, second or third interviews if you want to bring other team members who are remote and maybe working together. It's because you want to have, I'm going to, I get a sense that that's going to become more and more, and it has become more and more important um, especially with this remote hybrid um, culture that we've gone into. 100%. And people are definitely using second and third round interviews, sometimes first round interviews, to have multiple stakeholders on the call in order to shortcut the process, mainly for their own benefit. You know, forget about all the 
metrics I'm presenting that are related to the interview right. process, they're just like, well, why spend two separate hours of people doing this when they can do it together, they can have a shared experience, yeah. right? So that they're commenting on the same interview, right? Not the same person, two different interviews. So that's been beneficial, I think, for hiring managers to evaluate talent. Um, but but yeah, it's also access, right? I mean, just think how difficult it was to get that partner to meet that person because they decided they weren't going to be in the office that day or they were traveling for a customer. And now they can pop open a laptop, interview somebody for 30 minutes, and those hard to reach stakeholders become more reachable in a shorter amount of time that doesn't delay the pursuit of talent. Excellent. Now we have a question. This is one of Mike's favorite questions. And again, Mike can't be with us today, but uh, he loves, I'm sure he's listening somewhere. Um, what are your thoughts on obtaining the new IAPP, Artificial Intelligence Governance Professional certif Certification? That's a mouthful. Will it make me more competitive in obtaining an analyst or attorney role in privacy or e-discovery? Great not, question. Yeah, great question. The short answer is not yet. Uh, time will tell. I think any education or self-investment is, is good. Um, so I don't want to discourage any self-investment, but also, you know, why are you getting certified? And a lot of people go and get certified because they want to use that certification as leverage to get employment or to command a higher salary. And that certification right now is too new to determine if it will have that impact on your job search. In e-discovery, you're better off with a said certification or a technology tool specific certification coming from relativity or both or both or both, <laughs> right? Um, and and in, in an ideal world, it is both, right? Because they're teaching you very different things. Um, but I'll say this, a certification on AI will help you speak more intelligently about those topics and issues. And if you're looking to get a job in that world, the best advice I would give you is you need to start swimming with those sharks. And in order to swim with those sharks, you got to be able to speak their language, understand their vernacular, know what the problems are they're facing, have an opinion and perspective, and then go to these social outings where you can engage with those people in an environment where you can show off that knowledge or test that knowledge. And, and so for those reasons, you know, maybe that's the reason to get it so that you're armed with the necessary information to have an impact in a networking environment. And right now, the best way to get a job in AI is to know somebody. Yes. And I, and I would say there's a lot of other things, ways too, right? One, yes, take some courses. There's some free courses on AI out there that you can also take. Start to educate yourself. Listen to podcasts. One of my favorite podcasts that I've also been on is Cassie and, and Cassie is an attorney at King and Spaulding. That's great. She's Cassie Burns. Kathy Burns, King and Spaulding. She has a, a podcast on Apple, Spotify. It's a great podcast. Um, and she has individuals, not just from legal, but all through the AI uh, you know, universe. And so you can learn a lot. So start to follow those individuals. There's, uh, if you're a woman, there's an or a, a group that Cassie and a few others have started called AI for Baddies. Get involved in that. Um, you know, there's uh, there's so many different people who have uh, blogs and things out there on AI. So just immerse yourself in all of that and take there's free courses everywhere. Um, but yeah, get involved. I know ASEDS is working on our AI course, so we'll have something. But if you want to do that AI piece, I would say immerse yourself, learn, know who's talking about it. Go find those AI. I think you know, there's there's quite a few AI attorneys in this space. Get to know them, network them, network, connect with them on LinkedIn. I think that's a great way for you to start to get involved in that space more and more. Cool. I think we've yeah. got a, a little more data. We went through this. Yeah. Uh, remote hybrid, I mean, we can quickly go over this. We sort of talked about it. Probably the most important trend here, if we want to animate, is the amount of fully remote positions, right? We can see that the new norm is clearly three days or fewer in an office. The amount of jobs that were three days or fewer actually went up year over year, 2020, 21, 22, 23. We think it might go down a little bit this year, but more or less stays the same. What has changed dramatically are the amount of jobs that are 100% remote. So what you're seeing here in 2022 is that 69% of that 89% that were hybrid were fully remote. And that number drops, as you can see, aggressively to almost half in 2023, there are going to be a lot less fully remote jobs as people try to get back to the office because there are just a lot less jobs as compared to 2022. 
And most of them, particularly law firms and corporations, want you hybrid. But a lot of our vendors are now moving to a hybrid demand in the marketplace. Let me also say this, though. That number could tick up. And what right. would make it tick up is the use of contract and contract to hire resources, meaning we found that almost 90% of our contractors are 100% remote. And if you're hiring a contractor in order to circumvent your in-office re uh, requirements for direct hires, you may find that you're hiring more people in a fully remote capacity because they're contractors. If you're a job seeker who is running out of looking for opportunities that are direct hire that would keep you fully remote, you may want to consider exploring the gig economy. And look, some of these gigs are years long projects. Some of them are really high impact projects where you're going to make a lot of overtime hours. And yeah, you might only work nine months out of the year, but you might make more money working those nine months with overtime than you would in a full-time job. Um, and here at True, we offer all of our contractors benefits and 401k match, 4% 100 vests after a year. So we take care of our contractors as if they're real employees. We just can't guarantee that they're going to get the hours when they take those contracts. Although we have good estimates as to what to expect and what they can anticipate. So what will determine whether or not there are more fully remote hires and remember, these, this data is based on offers accepted, not jobs posted, right? Be a whole other metric to say like, hey, here's what people say they want when they hire. And then here's what they actually do when they yeah. need to acquire talent. And those are very different things. And what we're seeing are the most jobs that are filled fully remote are contract jobs. We've got another question. Great. Um. So the comment is, I can remember pre-pandemic where I would interview candidates through multiple levels. We wanted to make sure we only had A players. The pandemic ruined that timeline. Do you think we're moving back to a place where candidates should expect more levels of interviews? No. No. Um, less interviews. More people attending fewer actual interview appointments. Most of our hiring managers have, for mid-market, no more than three rounds. And the average is actually two. It's like 2.2. So most people are only having two rounds of interviews before they hire a PM, an analyst, um, an analytics specialist, a doc reviewer. Um, a lot of what we'll call um, managed review, review managers or doc reviewers uh, are hired on one and done, one and done interviews. Okay. Sometimes they're asked to fill out a survey beforehand to make sure they meet all the requirements. And then they have an interview with, you know, one interview with maybe one to three hiring managers, and then they make a decision. Excellent. Um, I'm trying to see, I think someone raised their hand and I just want to see if they want to unmute and ask a question or if that was by accident. I think it may have been by accident. All right. So some quick true trends here. Um, the average salary increase for somebody leaving a fully remote job to go hybrid, they expect about 25% increase from wherever they're at in order to facilitate and finance that commute and childcare costs that they don't have to incur, things like that. Um, for a job that's four to five days in an office, add another 90 days on average to the numbers we gave you earlier. Most of the job, I mean, if 92% of the jobs were filling a remote, those are our averages. In-office jobs can take another 90 days more and you'll have significantly less candidates. Uh, and a 50% increase in available talent when you shift from three to two days. So if you're a hiring manager and you've been banging your head searching for a job and you're not getting the candidates you want and you've got a three-day in-office requirement and you drop it to two, if you only saw you know five candidates, now you're going to probably see seven and a half to 10. Awesome. Then we kind of covered this. We could see that the trends in contracting are slowly ticking up. That has a lot to do with engaging remote workers. It also has a lot to do with We've gotten a lot of big projects, not we true, we the industry has just seen a lot more litigation, right? Um, I follow all of Kelly's stuff and how many, you know, um, cases are filed and all of that. And those have upticked a lot in the last um, six months compared to the prior six months. So, you know, we're seeing people use contractors in order to fill what they know will be fine, finite projects. Second requests are up over the last six months. That's led to a lot of like, hey, we need impact players for six month projects. Um, and also people hiring contract to hire is way up over 2023. A lot of people want to try and buy, particularly because they're looking to hire less experienced, less expensive talent, which is less proven. And as a result, there's a balance of risk appetite versus committing to a direct hire. 
And how many of those contract are moving into full-time roles afterwards? So um, in, in privacy, it's the last year, so far to date from 2023 to now in data privacy, it's 38% of our contractors converted. That's It's never been that high. It's an astonishingly high number. But keep in mind in privacy, the jobs are mostly in corporations who are far more budget hamstrung than in e-discovery where most of the jobs are at law firms and vendors where the minute you hire someone, they're becoming a revenue center as opposed to a cost center. So in e-discovery, it's in the like low teens. I think it's like 12, 15% because most of them are either perpetual contractors. Like we need someone on a second shift or, you know, we can't find what we're looking for. So we're going to hire a contractor remote anywhere. And then we'll see how it goes. And we're not registered to do um, employment in that state. Like a lot of our uh, customers, well, we're in New York, California, but there's someone amazing in Illinois and we're not going to register the law firm as a tax entity in Illinois. So we'll keep them on your payroll, True Staffing Partners, as a perpetual contractor. And we love them and they're great. And we'll keep them. That happens a lot more often, quite honestly, than conversion. Though there are conversions along the way. Okay. These are, uh, well, we're out of time, but these are the top five skills. When customers come to us and they want contractors, this is what they're looking for. Awesome. And I think we talked about starting to track some ASEDs certifications and training across, right? For we 20 are. So we are now tracking in our systems, people who we place that have ASED certifications at all levels of employment. And uh, we will start presenting those metrics. I mean, maybe in April. Yeah. Awesome. Very good. All right. So we're out of time. That is our eye on ESI for this month. Again, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Jared and team. Um, we love having you all. Uh, we had fewer questions this month, but we bring you all your questions. We'll be back next month and can't wait to talk with everybody.